Jesus heals the body, provides food for the hungry, and shows his power over nature. All signs to his godly identity and mission. On the Bible Brief. Pick up your Bible and read along with us today. Learning happens better with a Bible in your hand. John the Baptist has been beheaded. The great prophet sent as a messenger to prepare the way of the Lord has been killed. First, he was arrested for speaking out against a local king's immoral relationship with his brother's wife. And after that, John was held in prison for a while because the king feared killing him and causing a riot among the people. Yet eventually, the king did kill him. On the king's birthday, he promised to give his niece whatever she asked for and her mother convinced her to ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. So quickly and with no fanfare, John was beheaded. The great messenger of the Lord's ministry was over. And soon Jesus heard of it. Devastating news indeed. John had been a prophet, but he was also part of Jesus' extended family. The man had been killed for his godly ministry, and just as he was a forerunner for Jesus in life, he would be a forerunner in death. Jesus knew that his life would be taken for his own ministry as well. Upon hearing the news of John's death, Jesus boarded a boat with his disciples and began a short journey on the Sea of Galilee to an unpopulated and desolate place. No doubt he desired time away from the multitudes that had been following him throughout the region and this boat was a good way to ensure that they couldn't follow. These crowds had grown and grown since that conversation many months ago with Nicodemus, and Jesus of Nazareth was almost certainly a household name throughout the whole region. A boat had become a handy way to get around and to leave the crowds for a while. Now this wasn't the first time that he and his disciples had gotten away by boat, and surely the disciples would never forget one of those first times. Months prior, they'd been on the sea with Jesus during a great storm upon the waters, and they'd awoken Jesus only to see him command the wind and the waves to calm themselves. They would never forget their amazement that even the wind and the waves obeyed him. Yet this time Jesus wasn't sleeping, and as soon as they arrived at their destination, he removed himself from them to be by himself. Surely he was mourning and looking at his own future with foreboding. Prayer was on his lips, and his dependence on God the Father was being demonstrated, even in his sadness at the death of John. It was often his practice to pray to God alone, and even in this moment of devastating news, his prayers continued. Soon, however, Jesus began to hear them, voices like those he'd been hearing for a while now. Apparently, some of those eagle-eyed onlookers had watched Jesus' boat and seen right where he and the disciples had landed, and word spread quickly that Jesus was in a new location. Just as quickly, the crowds came by foot around the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and what was once a desolate place for Jesus to pray became the grounds of a gathering of not just a few hundred people, but considerably more than 5,000. Jesus heard them. And he saw them, and even in the midst of a desire to be alone, he had compassion on this massive crowd that had come to see him. He knew that they were like sheep without a shepherd, and they, like helpless sheep, needed him, his message, and his power. And so he began to go among the crowd and heal those who were sick, of which there were probably many given the size of the multitude. Miracles simply flowed from Jesus, because he being the original creator of all things, was obviously the most qualified to restore health to the weak. And many came to be healed by him. But today, in the midst of mourning the death of John, he would perform a miracle of amazing scale that none of them had seen before. After probably a long day of healing the sick, his disciples come up to him and say, This is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. 
they said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The miracle is as subtle as it is surprising. First, upon hearing the problem presented by the disciples, Jesus commands that the disciples give the crowd something to eat. But they present him with five loaves of bread and two fish. They say that this is the only provision available and seem to suggest that feeding this crowd with such little food just isn't possible. But then Jesus tells the crowd to take a seat. He looks up to heaven and blesses the food before distributing the loaves to the disciples. And apparently he just keeps giving more and more bread to the disciples, who in turn give more and more to the crowd. It's as if the five loaves become innumerable loaves enough to feed 5,000 men along with women and children. All said and done, the crowd's hunger is satisfied, and the leftover pieces exceed the number of loaves that Jesus started with. The Messiah had multiplied the five loaves to feed well over 5,000 people. Though he started with healing the sick, he finished the day by feeding the hungry, miraculous provision provided in a desolate place. Now, we could look at this event with awe at this miracle of Jesus. But if we look a layer deeper and remember back in our Bibles, we'll remember a time when God fed people bread in a desolate place as well. Remember after the exodus from Egypt, Yahweh provided His people bread in the wilderness, that manna bread from heaven. Well, here, God is doing it again for this crowd of thousands in the wilderness of Galilee. It's another callback to demonstrate the identity of Jesus, even through a miracle that echoes the miracles of the past. But Jesus, after healing many people and providing them food to eat, still isn't done even though night had begun to fall. Within a few hours, Jesus would show even another miracle to his disciples. After the crowd had eaten, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. You can imagine the conversation of the disciples, going from amazement at the events of the day, to quickly speaking about how the wind had picked up and the waves were coming in more violent than usual. Perhaps at that point, the disciples began to question why Jesus didn't just come with them from that deserted location. They knew that he was always seeking a place of solitude for prayer, but it sure would have been nice for him to come tonight. They remembered the relief they felt when Jesus had calmed the storm before, and surely some of them wished that he was there to do it again tonight. But suddenly, just as dawn was beginning to think about breaking, one of them saw something in the distance. It was a figure calmly coming toward them. But it wasn't sinking, no, it was walking as if the waves were dry land. Then they all looked, and many said, It is a ghost! And they began to tremble and cry out in fear. Jesus would have known what to do, but he wasn't anywhere to be found. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Nothing could have prepared the disciples for that moment. And even some of them still didn't understand what was happening. How could a mere man walk upon the water? How could this be? What did this mean? So Simon Peter was the first one to speak. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! 
Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The conclusion of the disciples to worship Jesus was the only appropriate response to such a display of majesty and power. Not only did he heal, not only did he provide the bread, but he also walked upon the stormy seas. Perhaps a few of them even remembered Moses' words from that Exodus 1,500 years prior. The Israelites were facing seas of their own with the Egyptians at their back. And Moses had said, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. But on this Sea of Galilee, Jesus didn't appeal to God like Moses. He didn't appeal to anyone as he walked up on the waters. Instead, he said, It is I. Do not fear. And then he even demonstrated that through Peter's faith, he himself could walk upon the waters too. Jesus' power didn't merely stop at him. Jesus' power extended to anyone who had faith in him too. And what humility Peter must have felt after this. He'd walked upon the waters with Jesus, and yet he'd failed to continue in faith as fear enveloped him, before ultimately being saved from sinking by Jesus. Surely he was ashamed at his doubts in the moment. But more so, he was probably encouraged that doubts didn't mean death for him. Jesus had his grip on Peter, even when Peter's faith failed in a fearful moment. Jesus was doing many signs and wonders such as these throughout Galilee and Judea. He was demonstrating his utter uniqueness and constantly preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. He was healing people and doing other wonders before many. The disciples had begun to understand who Jesus was, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Yet through all these signs, the crowd still wondered who he was. Perhaps because the natural conclusion was so utterly different than expected. Many thought that the Messiah would simply show himself as a conquering king to remove the Roman oppressors from the land of Canaan. And Jesus didn't appear to fit that bill. Many thought that Jesus was just a continuation of John the Baptist's ministry, yet he was doing all these signs and wonders that John had never done. Some finally concluded that he was a great prophet sent by God who has oppressed people. Yet despite all these miracles, some concluded that he was a menace leading the people astray. Some said that he worked by demonic power to deceive people with his tricks. Some perhaps didn't care who he was, so long as he was dealt with. He was upsetting too many people among the elites of the day, and those upsets would have consequences. Curiously, though, Jesus continued to preach in an enigmatic way. Rather than simply declaring among all the villages of Judea, saying, I am the Messiah, put your faith in me. Instead of doing this, outside of demonstrating his godly power through these signs, he also taught about the kingdom of God in short stories called parables. And these stories would serve a great purpose in the coming months. Because while some heard them and believed, others couldn't understand them and rebelled. The faithful get encouraged, and the faithless grow even colder. All because of some little stories. Join us next time as we explore the parables of Jesus. Parables that reveal and divide. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2023